functional, unfunctional people in the world. And I was the king. Someone that has created 51 businesses had some daddy issues. And, and yeah, that would be me. I think most people think uh, walking the line of balance is, is getting up at 6.30, exercising till 7.30, having breakfast, reading the news, going to work, home right at five o'clock. That doesn't work for most people that have real impact. Jumping out into a hot fire and just starting something new. Yeah, okay, it's exciting. But end of the day, I want my children to have a stable path and platform to start their lives on. We live in our business life really rigidly that generates a bunch of wealth, that then creates a bunch of wealth, that then causes our family to all fall apart. And then personally, we have to carve out. And then our families build up and it's just like this very harsh uh, modality. I like to tip that over and live cycles of flow where we have our individual values, our family values, our business values, and our wealth, meaning time and money. We are well, wealth, that's what it means. So that lives in flow, which provides the up and downs in lives. We don't want to be static beings, but I don't want my kids falling off a cliff. There's a difference this. between a dream chaser and a dream catcher. Hey everybody, and welcome to the Dream Catchers Podcast. I'm your host, Jerome. And when I tell you, you're in for a treat today, you have no idea what you've stumbled into. We've got Rich Christensen in with us, and he is a referral to the podcast from our good friend, Garrett Gunderson. Now, Rich has one of the most dynamic backgrounds that I have encountered on this journey. And with being over 300 guests, and you can only begin to imagine what that might mean. Rich is started or either co-founded over 50 businesses. And many of those have had tremendous success. Now, the other side of that is he's had some exits and those exits have had big impact. The thing that I love most about Rich is I've gotten to know him is his emphasis on family and having values that allow you to not just create financial wealth, but wealth in relationship with those who are going to precede you or uh, follow you through and help create and further the legacy. But with that said, I shouldn't try to tell the whole story myself because Rich lived it and he can tell it way better than I can. And so with that, Rich, thank you so much for joining us on the on the podcast today. I think this is going to be a phenomenal episode. Oh, Jerome, it's just really nice to be with you. And just thank you for the way you approach this, your calm, middle grounded energy and just what a privilege to be here. And yeah, everyone wants to quote my 51 businesses. But the thing that isn't quoted is, yeah, I've had 17 multi-million dollar exits. But the thing I'm really proud of is the failures. I've failed 19 times. And so I think just doing it properly and balanced as entrepreneurs, are, it's, the, it's the best way to control our life that there is. It's the best way for impact that I've found in this world. But oftentimes we also really do tend to get out of balance and out of whack. And I think as I become a little older, maybe a little bit more owlish, uh, that's the message I'm driving to now is, is, is where the balance, peace and, and moderation is in life. Now, I'm very curious about that, and I think we should just dive in. You've already uh, checked the first box. The question is, have you? so you had an exit. And the answer is yes. You've done it seven, over 17 times, right? And 17, well, I say 17. You said 17 multi-million dollar exits. Yeah, I, I probably don't had want seven or eight exits, but yeah. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. with all of those resources the thought that you could be out of balance would probably escape most people. No, yeah. no, no. I, I think it's dead truth. I think entrepreneurs tend to be the most functional, unfunctional people in the world. And I'm the king. Someone that has created 51 businesses had some daddy issues. And, and yeah, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> always trying to prove and earn love. And, you know, no one would have really guessed it, Jerome. But the reality is, is I think we do have phases of life. And I don't regret my path and journey. As a matter of fact, on the other side of this, I, I'm quite proud of it. But I, I love David Brooks' uh, book, the, the Second Mountain. And he talks about the first phase of life. It's about glory and on top and winning. And, you know, I've been there. I've, I, man, I've eaten that. Oh, that frosty, thick, sugary cake. 
more more times than I care to admit. And when you get done with that, it's not satisfying. The second mountain he highlights is as being the mountain of impact and meaning. And I've done that. I've done that multiple times. That's also meaningful. And I think that the place we land, but I think that next time I have a conversation with David, we're going to talk about the third hidden plateau. And that is, is, is what's the relationship with yourself? Do you really love yourself? Have you faced your dragons and demons? And you actually, can you laugh at your own bad jokes? Can you uh, be settled in who you are in your relationship with your deity or God or divine or universe or whatever you want to call it? And I got to tell you, that's the real jam. That's what the human soul really is striving for. And it's kind of crazy to hear, hear a hopped up uh, entrepreneur that, yeah, I helped define the lean startup movement for crying out loud. And it takes us so far, but it doesn't take us all the way. So I really have become about moderate balance in all of my content uh, the last probably six or seven years of, of getting this to the balance, middle, moderate way of living in balance. So what does balance actually mean? Because I think people struggle with balance. They yeah, they do. And I define balance dramatically different than most. I think most people think uh, walking the line of balance is, is getting up at 6.30, exercising till 7.30, having breakfast, reading the news, going to work, home right at 5 o'clock. That doesn't work for most people that have real impact. I believe in crossing them, go living to extremes. I non-apologetically will not sleep for a week burning a hot and then take my wife on a cruise and sleep for 12 hours and then go to a surge with this next book I'm launching. I mean, right now I'm kind of in a surge of preparing for a huge couple of months. So I think balance, the way I define balance, and everyone gets their own view on it, but is 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 cross the line of balance as frequently as possible, but don't non-apologetically I wasn't to all, and I, I'm one of the best fathers I've ever seen, but I wasn't to every baseball game that my kids had as grew up. But boy, when I was present, I was a month with them in the Himalayas, hiking nonstop, deeply engaged in their life at the critical phases. Balance to me is not walking a straight line. It's about crossing a line of balance as frequently as possible. That's the way you live big, impactful lives. So to me, that sounds... I. I see a pendulum and the pendulum swings. And when the pendulum is straight up and down, it seems like that would be the line and you're going from one place to the other and f coming back. And so you, know, you call it balance. You said that I had, uh, I think, middle of the road energy. We, in our framework, we call that centered. Right? Mm -hmm. The goal is Beautiful. to be centered. You're coming back to center and you get away from it, but you always know what right is, right? There's yeah. a home base. And you also mentioned like a higher power or, you know, whoever you answer to, answer to that authority figure in your world. Those things I think are being stripped in a lot of ways from the way a lot of people live in society. The institutions, they're saying they, they're irrelevant or, you know, they're ancient and they don't fit in today's world, but you've anchored there. Yeah. Why? Deeply anchored there. As a matter of fact, I'm convinced the much of the anxiety and the pressure and the insanity, the, the hot temperature is, is because we fundamentally lost our community. And the, the very core of our community is 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 is, uh, is our families, and the nucleus of why we're so hot politically and hot on all these topics is it's easier to hate someone and be part of a community hating than it is actually to to be lonely. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I, my last big work I, I know that you probably wanted to talk about that was Legato Family Framework. Because if we can get our family stable again, if we can get our tribes, and I don't say that in a negative context, but our deepest knit communities stable again, then a lot of this hot energy goes and we just discovered that nine tenths of it is just nothing more than just tinkling noise. So yeah, fundamentally, I believe that rooting back to family and rooting back to the structures that that do work, uh, I, I believe uh, deeply in following working frameworks and then repairing them. I mean, jumping out into a hot fire and just starting something new. Yeah, okay, it's exciting, but end of the day, I want my children to have a stable path and platform to start their lives on. Okay. 
And so that dovetails directly into Legato. So how did you come up with it? What is it? And then we can come back to yeah, the foundation well, that you've got for the boys. Because what you've described of, as far as their success to this point, I've never heard of. Not yeah. the repeatability of it and then the magnitude of it. Yeah, thank you for asking. It's really tender to me, to be honest with you. Uh, this is something that uh, I came up with and deployed in my family with my wife some 25, 30 years ago. Uh, the story all began when uh, I, I grew up, my wife and I, in a very poor uh, circumstances, and uh, it became very evident early in my career. I was named general manager of Mitsubishi Electric at a very young age. It became very evident that I was going to have some successes, and so my wife and I's solution to not screwing our kids up, our family up, was to move to a very poor neighborhood and never tell them. And I had a friend that came to me a couple of years later and says, Rich, this is this. I've seen you do stupid things, but this is the top of the list of stupid, because what are you going to do when your kids do discover it? And if you do pull this ruse off, you're going to blow your grandkids up. And so I thought about it and realized how truthful he was. So at that point, uh, my uh, mentor was an amazing individual named uh, Stephen Covey. And so I went to Stephen and we had a conversation. He says, yeah, yeah, I don't know framework. He offered the family mission statement. So true to every entrepreneur, I kind of formulated this crude platform that now has become the, the Legato family framework. And I promptly proceeded not to tell anyone. Some of my friends, Garrett Gunderson, top of the list, would come to me and say, ah, no, 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 Garrett, I'm not going to talk about it because I really don't know if it'll work until my grandkids are raised. Bit by bit, he kind of pulled me out of it. About six years ago, I had a profound spiritual personal experience where I was basically told the world's got to have this framework. And so uh, at that point, with a big gulp, because I was very much enjoying my kind of private, hidden, uh, making role of not being on the pin, you know, out in front, but kind of building others. Uh, but I agreed to come forward with this. And so indeed, that became the platform of the Legato family framework to help stabilize families, communities, and uh, our tribes, our most close knit tribes. So, what does Legato mean? Because most people would use their last name. For this but that's no, not what you did no 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 legato means harmony harmony and flow it uh, i think it's italian but it just means living in life in harmony and flow i love it and so what are the pillars that are holding up the legato family framework well and, and I have to pre-qualify that there's nothing new here. <laughs> actually if you look throughout history any institution indoors whether it's your favorite university, your sports team for crying out loud, whether it's a, a religion or a uh, a government, they all enact on these pillars. And so we just pulled that as I was digging into what structures endured, that's what I went to. So it always starts with platform of values. Uh, most people think to do that in their business, but most couples have never actually done that. And just having a core of six or seven or eight, this is what we're going for platform of values is always the starting point. And if there's things you disagree, that's fine. Pull them apart. You can you don't have to go to the things you disagree on, but what do you agree in? That alone would be an amazing start. But I think equal to what values you agree in is this what do you want to throw away? What has come into your family or learned behaviors that you're throwing away? In both my wife and I's family, guilt and shame were used and some good dose of scarcity, which is like peanut butter and jam to get any behavior you wanted. So we right up front agreed we are throwing that in the garbage can and epigenetically removing that from our children going forward. So values and what you throw away. And then up on that, any institution that adores is built on three principles. And then I added a fourth. Uh, the first is symbols. What symbols do you do? You're wearing a beautiful purple color. That means something to you and even the, the coloring behind you. If you were to change the, uh, let's let's pick a, the San Francisco 49ers to a nice vibrant blue and they're no longer the 49ers, they're now the, the Rockets, the friends would revolt because symbology allows us to identify and connect to show what we are. That's why we align with certain brands we don't with others. Uh, so the question I'd ask you listeners, do you have a spirit animal? Do you have a shadow animal? 
what is the colors that you represent in your family? Does each family member have their own color? Uh, what do you have a crest, a logo, a symbology? If not, that's what we touch that we know that we're part of the Christ. And, and I'll tell you that what you're going to compete with, well, it's the Bloods, it's the Crips, it's the 49ers, because they do it marvelously. We ultimately, in our very instinctual nature, need to know, do I fit or what do I not to fit? That's how if you walk into a crowd and you see someone else wearing a like cool vibe, middle way purple, instantly you're going to be drawn. You say, hey, hey, buddy, you know, we're there. And uh, you don't see a lot of people driving Subarus, also driving four by four, four fifty four, four barrel, four car, four wheel drives. You know, it says something, the brands that we use. So what are you choosing to brand that matches your values? This concept of having symbols is so freaking powerful. Uh, early on, we developed this beautiful, I wish I had it here. I'm in a hotel, so you won't be able to see it, but I'll describe it. In, in, in our family, we developed this beautiful center, my wife in white. She's the pure, she's the store, she's the center. I surround her in, in a circle of black uh, in, in the middle, uh, holding safe space for her. And then each of my sons in their colors, John in uh, green, Nathan in dark blue, Matthew in red, Timmy in yellow, and uh, Alex in light blue with these little triangles all pouring in. And we never turn our, it means we never turn our backs on each other. We always look inward to each other. We support acknowledging that, you know, my wife is the center of all of our creation. Then when my sons, they have these little black dots when they get married, they then light up and we go through this special ritual. I'll talk about that in a second. Maybe a deep tradition is a better word that they light up and then they play that role. Then all my little grandkids, they get to pick their color on the outside when they come in. You know, when they show up at our house room, they'll say, Grandpa, that much, because that means Grandpa loves you more than that much. And then they'll instantly get a candy and then they'll go touch their symbol because they know where they fit. Grandpa, Grandpa, Nathan, Nathan, Ho, oh, Everly. And they touch and they know where they fit because it's a sense of belonging. So we don't brand things we don't believe in. Most every bit of apparel that we wear now uh, is uh, is the family logo or our spirit animals. When I buy a gift, we always give it to them in their color because the ultimate human need is to be seen. And being seen just by having, you, know, you can say things about your spirit animal. I'm a mountain gorilla. My wife happens to be a dolphin. They're wonderful. But when my wife's bat shows up, and I'm a lizard. Lizards don't like bats. So all I have to do is say, ah, oh, ah, oh, bat, ooh, here's a plate of food. And I'll put on my little lizard I had to duck out. And instantly it saves this big bone-on-bone -bone fight. So I went to that really quickly. But pillar number one is always the symbols that we use to identify we belong. Identify we belong. It's so fascinating that you said the ultimate need is to be seen. Because I watch so many people do so much to not be seen. They're hiding. Yeah. And so let's go there because you said yeah. something that I feel so many people use to manipulate other people. You talked about throwing away guilt and shame. And I mean, if you think about frequencies, those are very low frequency emotions. Yeah. How can you throw that away? The map of consciousness. Um, yeah, the map of consciousness, the lowest frequencies are guilt and shame. I pair it with me everywhere and I see it operating now. Well, the first is to recognize that you're operating there. Second is, is doing your personal work, which is a completely, we got to have two or three podcasts to cover all of that one, because that's my most recent work, my personal work of getting to that self-love. But I think that the big thing is, is, is then the second pillar is the doctrine that you put in place. So, you know, a family mission statement, a family constitution, the family ethos, if you will, family song. And then everyone has acknowledgement that any time that shows up is say, no, no, we don't operate in that. Uh, growing up that way, at times I'll slip in just, gosh, two weeks ago, my third big powerful son, Nathan, came to me and says, Dad, Dad, we don't talk negative about ourselves. You're using negative self-talk. And uh, th that's not something we do in our family. It's because it was declared on the function of the doctrine that we live in. 
So I think that the doctrinal part, which is the second pillar, it's our constitution, it's a declaration of independence, it's how we operate so you know the rules of how you engage with the tribe or the symbology and colors. And if you have really good doctrine, you don't need a bunch of rules. You show me an organization with a bunch of messy rules and I'll show you an organization or a structure that does not have really good stabilizing doctrine and understand their values. Okay. So that's an, I've not ever used that word when thinking about family doctrine. What does doctrine mean? Cause I think we need operational definition for that. Yeah. It sounds a little harsh, doesn't it? I know I kind of wish I had a better word. Maybe e ethos, it's the implementation of the values. So it's the statements. So you have your platform of values, but then you have your, I don't want other word to use, honestly. I've tried and tried, but I think it has to be doctrinal because it's that significant. It's the operating paradigm that you put to of this is how we operate. It's mission statements, it's ethos, it's declarations that you hang around and post. Um, you know, not from a time our kids were very little, we had our, and thank you, Stephen Covey, because he's the one that provided that first context. But it, it is just the operating mode of how we behave can be done in the form of songs. You know, the love song I wrote to my wife to get her to convince her to marry me, or the fun little uh, songs that our family now sings and have even created. Okay. So I want to come I'm, back. I'm sorry, I'm going fast, but you've asked. No, this is do this in like 40 minutes. And um, yeah, this is like hours, days, discussions. <laughs> well, I, I think it's going to be more than enough to wet the whistle for the listeners and force them to dig in and learn more. So I want to go back to throwing away yeah. shame and guilt. Yeah. So you you mentioned your son bringing up the doctor and bringing up the values yeah. and saying, hey, we don't do that here. Yeah. When people are experiencing the shame and guilt, they usually want to hide. They don't yeah. want other people to know what happened. And that ties hand in hand with not wanting to be seen. Yeah. You figured out, I think, you've yeah. helped program in a way for the folks in your family to, I don't want to say avoid, but not experience that. Yeah. How did, how? Like, no, I don't agree with that. I think the okay. best, where it, rather than hide and run, I think it's run right towards what's happened. And it's, this is kind of the personal part of the story of, you know, blindsided the book that I'm coming out with. But what I've found is, is having the courage to face our fears, spiritual with reality, run directly towards them, live in them, sit them. And then they just aren't big, scary dragons anymore. So uh, uh, the open dialogue rather than push away and hide it under the monster underneath the bed is, is I think the approach that I might suggest but part of that is, is also then being the standard bearer of, you know, in the doctrine that, no, no, we don't do guilt and shame. So when that does fall into that, we can say, whoa, 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 hey, buddy, I love you too much. I love you too much. We're not doing that. As my son did for me and as I've done for them countless times. Yeah, I want to go back to this statement because I make a statement that our ultimate deepest need is to be seen. But also our biggest fear is being fully manifest and seen. And it's okay to have both sides of that coin. As a matter of fact, I beg you, don't go out with your deepest concerns and issues and don't go running out to the world and put them on the flagpole and flap it around. That's just foolish. You're begging, you know, to get trash. So doing that intimately and then tenderly in the environments that I call it blood sisters, blood brothers, or even your significant trust network that you know they'll have your back, that's the place to fully manifest and be seen. The tragedy is, is with the breakdown of the family, community, and their, our tribes, most people do not even have one or two people that they can trust with that. And that's why they're so tight suppressed in. And that's what's causing the divisiveness to go join in this oh, terrible conflicts that we're having both politically, environmentally, is because it's better to stand against someone and be part of something than to be alone. 
Ooh. Now, I didn't expect you to say be alone, but it's very interesting that crowds rally around something that they don't like. Yeah. And it's more easy to do that than to get people to rally around things that they do. Yeah. Is that just human nature or is there more to it? No, I, I and you know, that's a pretty deep question. You're going to have to probably get someone a little... <laughs> a little deeper than me to answer that but my observation has been just it's a lot more complicated to build and lift and build something and up is to tear it down and oftentimes when we get to these lower cycles that you're just talking and pointing to we could go to the other ones like anger and and uh, you know abuse and all of those uh is is just easier to spend energy there and we are frequency energy beings we can pulse out that's why instantly I said, man, that's beautiful middle way balanced energy. I saw your energy. I know it. <laughs> and then you point out to me your ethos. And of course, you've set the standard and you've done this very thing in your podcast. So the question now is, is have you done it in your family? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's very much balanced. Or right. I'll say centered. There's you know, we want to experience the highs. We want to experience the lows because if you numb either one, you don't get the full get the full feeling of the other. But we want to come back to a very neutral place. I like neutral. I like yeah. it because it gives you the flexibility. I played football for seventeen years, and in that, you know, being in a neutral space allowed you to go either direction. It allowed you to respond to whatever stimulus you had. And it kept you from being hurt because if you're too rigid, of course, you know, you, you don't have the ability to flow with or be in harmony with the things that are happening in the world. And there are times where you need to be rigid and, you know, you need to assert yourself and be in a space. But I watch people try to assert themselves and maybe there's a tidal wave coming and it's like, well, this isn't a winning battle. It's better for you That's to right. ride the wave. Yeah. It, take advantage of the energy and then come back and show up in a different space where uh, the likelihood of your success is a lot higher because you, you've taken advantage of the opportunities that are placed in front of you. So, yeah, I mean, we work hard, but it's, it's work every day. Oh yeah, and it is. With every it, person. It Can I jump? And I know we're on the Legato framework, but I, I love the model you've uh, you've talked and articulated. I call it cycle of force or an inverted, a vertical infinity symbol. Mm -hmm. Well, we live in our business life really rigidly that generates a bunch of wealth, that then creates a bunch of wealth, that then causes our family to all fall apart. And then personally, we have to carve out. And then our families build up. And it's just like this very harsh uh, modality. I like to tip that over and live cycles of flow where we have our individual values, our family values, our business values, and our wealth, meaning time and money. We are well, wealth, that's what it means. So that lives in flow, which provides the up and downs in lives. We don't want to be static beings, but I don't want my kids falling off a cliff. Hey guys, as you might know, a very small percentage of the people who actually listen to this podcast are subscribers. So do us a favor, subscribe. In fact, we did some analytics and we found out that only 25% of the people who listen are subscribers. And our goal is to get that to about 75% over the next three months. So do us a favor, hit the subscribe button so you get notified when our new episodes come. We plan to bring immense value to you guys going forward as we continue to improve the content that we create at Dreamcast. Your dream should be real. Let's get back to the show. Uh, I work with a lot of the ultra wealthy families here throughout the, well, in the US and through the world. And I was just shocked that 70% of all wealth is lost by the second generation, 30% by the, 90% uh, by the third. The reason for that is not the stupid kids. It's they don't want to be handcuffed and held in that rigid construct. The human soul needs to be able to go up and down, but I want to do it in a flow manner rather than a harsh force manner. That's a, a stat that I think for would make a lot of people question whether or not they want to build it. 
and maybe it makes a case for the folks who want to die on zero or um, have to give do and sign those giving pledges because it's like, well, it's not going to actually be here. We're not going to be, I don't know if it's Rockefeller or Vanderbilt, but you know, the one family still has wealth and the other one fell yeah. to the stat. Uh, and I think there's been a lot of studies on how one company, one family was more successful than the other as far as being able to retain the wealth and the descendants to be able to live off what was created by the patriarch and the respective family. You 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 talked about wealth, business, family, and there was one personal. more. Is it personal? Yeah, the personal is the real cat's meow. It's that hidden plateau that I think we all aspire for. And it's being comfortable and with ourselves. And honestly, that's been the primary focus I've had the past couple of three years uh, uh, going to a, the, maybe the ultimate crisis of faith and the ultimate uh, identity challenge. So so what open, if you're open to it, because I know that's uh, deeply personal and I haven't been able to find much on you as it relates to that. So what opened the door and then what did you find in that? I call it going in the cave, Rich. You yeah. go in the cave and you know, you're trying to figure out how to make fire. Yeah. And when you find it, you want everybody to see your discovery. Yeah. Uh, but that journey into the cave and that dark space and it being cold and damp yeah. isn't a space that you want a whole lot of people in. But I think people may be able to learn some stuff. And because we're throwing away shame and, and guilt, I, I think you might be a person that can actually share this in a in a way that folks can digest it. Thank you for uh, recognizing and seeing that because we haven't really discussed that, but maybe it's the ultimate, uh, I don't call it accomplishment because it is the high plateau where it's not ego associated with it. Um, if I could just back up a little bit and tell a little of my backstory, it may be a, a little relevant. I mean, what inspires an individual to create 51 businesses? I mean, that's a lot of, that's a lot of energy, right? <laughs> Uh, I grew up in a home where my father was uh, blind. Uh, he lost his first eye at the age of two. And at the age of four, his parents had to make the terrible, impossible decision right in the middle of the Great Depression, where the only prospects for a little blind boy was to either work for a circus or become a, pro a professional beggar. And uh, my grandfather won the argument. They they ended up doing, removing his second eye to retinal blastoma with only a maybe one in 20 chance that he would actually live. And obviously he did live. He uh, it turned out he had an eidetic memory, which means that you could give me some big long number. Uh, Just spit out a number. 318, 792, 584. All right. 30 years later, my father could recite verbatim that number to you. That's an eidetic memory. He didn't only not join a circus, but he became uh, the first blind attorney that I've heard of. He passed the bar blind, went on to have the highest prosecution rate uh, in, in the state, and uh, he could quote case law that judges had never even heard of. He was vicious in the, uh, in the courtroom. And that was my entire identity. My mom was 15 years younger than him, a beauty queen, stunningly beautiful, multiple marriage proposals, and married my father two years after their marriage interstage left the oldest son of John and Laurel Christensen Rich. And that was my childhood, this amazing, beautiful childhood of having bells on my shoes so my dad could follow me around, age five, tuning the carburetor, uh, and just remarkable, amazing, but not normal childhood. The reality is, is from the age of five or six, I was actually an adult. And uh, I loved my father. I worshipped him. But no matter what I did, I could never quite prove it all the way. And it did cause a lot of consternation through my adult life, trying to actually earn and prove it. And uh, ups and downs through there, I'll cut to the chase. But when I was 53 years older, uh, my younger brother, who looked very different than us other three brothers, uh, decided to take a DNA test at a great big party to show, hey, uh, I am actually not the milkman's son. As he opened it and read the results, it turns out he was 50% uh, Jew. 
a fairly rare form of Jew. And instantly we thought, oh, well, that was a waste. But then a geneticist came up and says, no, no, that really is true. One by one by one, my brothers and I took DNA tests and then through clandestine operation where we snuck some of dad's DNA, got all our sent it in, we discovered that none of us were uh, the children of John Christensen. At first, we were very concerned that my mom may have uh, been skanking around. And it uh, turns out we we're also not brothers, other than my youngest, uh, my second brother and I were full brothers. But there's no way she could have done it. So as we dug a little bit deeper, we finally decided, you go to your 93-year-old father. Mom died young, so she wasn't around. Do you go to your 93-year-old father and say, Dad? Hey, we're not your kids. And mom might have been getting some on this side. You do it. <laughs> so we finally says, no way. We approached him. And his response was, uh, this was the first order of business in the life ever after. You caught us. It's the only time I've seen my father cry. And he went on to explain that uh, they had very privately made the decision, never told anybody, because as an attorney, it was illegal. He would have went to jail. Second of all, in our religion, it was excommunicatable. They would have got picked out of the room. <laughs> and third of all, all the shame that came with it. And so it turns out I'm one of the first donor conceived kids there is. <laughs> it was nefarious is the word that they used. And uh, if that isn't complicated enough, uh, I'm, I we grew up in the LDS or the Mormon faith. And as uh, we... Uh, dug a little bit deeper, we found my biological father, who was long dead, but uh, he looks exactly like me. He behaves exactly like me. He's an entrepreneur. And every matter of fact, all of his children became financially independent all by themselves. Everyone is a doctor and an entrepreneur, which he was the first abortion doctor in the state of Utah. Needless to say, it completely disassembled every part of my identity. At the time, I was actually a bishop in the in the Mormon faith. And so it took a lot of reconciliation to come to the understanding. Nobody was ever told. When I knew something was off, when I was 12 years old, I went to my mom and said, Mom, something's not quite right here. Am I adopted or something? I'm like this weird kid in this little rural town. She says, no, 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 no. You're my son but she didn't tell me the truth. And so I spent the last three or four years, I've sold all my businesses. I went very private. And this is when I started doing the deeper, deeper inner soul work of getting to flow. I now understand very clearly what it takes to get out of guilt and shame. And I can honestly say, Jerome, I love myself. I laugh at my own jokes. I'm not only settled, but just realize this I don't want to swear, so I won't say, yeah, I will. I'll say, this shit's just not that serious. We don't need to wind it up. And I did a lot of deep personal work and did some pretty unconventional things to get to this balance of flow. I can say with boldness, I already won the freaking, I mean, I've climbed that damn first mountain so many times, there's no one that's going to climb it more. If I can't do it in 51 times, you're not going to do it in 10 or 15, okay? There's nothing on the top of that mountain over there other than crispy cream donuts that make you feel good and then you get a sugar buzz and feel sick i've created the stable family i've had the wealth that's fueled a lot of real good and even done the personal things but the real impact in life comes on facing your demons spiritual with reality having the courage to face your brokenness is an integral part of your healing and getting good with yourself internally. And that's what I worked on. And, and that's actually what this blindsided book about is that first loop, the I, then the we, and then the, the public facing the wealth and integrating that so that we can flow more naturally in life. And whew, I'm now done with rent, 5,439. <laughs> I don't think it was a rant. I think it was a deep stream of consciousness. And I appreciate your vulnerability because I can only imagine how that hit. I, oh, I, you can't make it up, man. I was on the floor on such a level. I mean, even to the board, I, I didn't trust my wife. I mean, it was like, how do I know you're not lying? She graciously, I made, a, I made a commitment to myself not to do four things. First of all, to just run off, run to Asia. Number two, to start drinking and doing drugs or smoking pot or something. Didn't do that. Number three is not to go have a tour de faire, blow everything up. 
and number four not to swear and i broke number four three did it for, did okay but i, I swore privately like a sailor on the tell said words i'd never said before but uh, at one point my wife uh as i said i says let's take a dna test so the, the down spot where i started healing was very similar to the test my brothers and i took where it was announced not john's son not john's son not john's son not john's son we did that same test with my boys and we had a celebratory dinner as we announced John Richard Christiansen is the son of Richard John. Matthew Brett is the son of Richard John. Nathan Vaughn is the son of Richard John. Timothy Tyrus is the son of Richard John. And Alex Hans is the son of Richard John. And that was the resolution point where I knew I had stability and built this beautiful energy. And then at that point, it just became this path out of darkness and doubt to the point that, you know, it's like now I feel like I'm the luckiest guy in the world to have had this amazing three strands of DNA. But don't think for one second, uh, it was not complicated and challenging. How did you find forgiveness? Because that's the only thing that I believe can get you through. That. Yeah. Well, I think there's multiple angles of forgiveness. Uh, I think, first of all, expressing the motion and going there, not just bottling it up. And I'm I'm not ashamed to say I wasn't scorching red hot with dad and with mom and with a lot of people and myself. And so I think having a safe place to express the motion. But then also, again, that you talk you talk about uh, the middle or the, the I say the balance, but again, back to the middle. And then I for a period of time, I was droopy, droopy. Oh, poor me. But then at some point you come back into this moderate thing and realize we're all kind of just doing the very best we can. And oh my gosh, how much was I loved that mom and dad would make that ultimate sacrifice and break every freaking rule that there was to bring me here. And then at that point becomes this huge acceptance and gratitude. Um, without blowing the whole outcome, the very last chapter answers in a, a pure flow of consciousness from heaven that answer and so i'm not gonna give that uh, i'm gonna hold that for the readers to listen on the uh, last chapter but i will say this boldly i now not only know but i just internalize that i'm the luckiest guy on earth and i'm i'm more than okay with what happened it's like i think i chose it on the other side whatever that means and it's like we need to embrace all of this craziness and realize it's just soul expansion experiences so i i'd like to parallel this or use it as a metaphor for what i think most founders experience when they exit their business yeah the identity is usually so wrapped up in what they did for a decade, two, three, four years. And yeah. they're trying to figure out who they are without the title or I'm yeah. the owner of, or I'm the founder yeah. of. Do you, you think that the process that you went through would help them figure out who they are? Or is there a deeply, better way? Deeply, very much. And those of you that are in that situation make a couple requests of you. First of all, is don't make any critical decisions, at least for a year. And second of all, give yourself quiet time to go sit with your five-year-old self and your teenage self and discover again the very essence of who you really are. Uh, the most profound wisdom that I got is, as I was kind of walking through that, and I've been through the exit thing a number of times, so I, I know very much that we, it's just all are formed up here on this top loop, and we haven't formed enough down here in the I thing, and so this is a beautiful chance for you to discover who you really, really deeply, truly are, and don't confuse love and respect with people that are just actually sucking you and using you. It's actually sequestering and decreasing the size of those that are closest is a beautiful, healthy thing to do. Um, I was dear friends with a professional uh, basketball coach and he got fired very unceremoniously. And as I went over that night, we gave, shared a few tears and I gave him a hug and, and uh, he turned to me and says, well, Rich, at least I now know how funny my jokes really are. And like how profound is that that he recognized that everyone used to laugh before but these these quiet times give us the chance to really determine who do i really love who really loves me 
And that's what we should build on. And oftentimes those very core are the people we disrespect and take for granted the most. We need to be spending our time there, not all on the friends out on Facebook and social media. That's stupid. On the very, very core of who do I love and who loves me? That's where we need to put our juice. I, I've always said that it doesn't make sense that we treat the people closest to us the worst. <laughs> that we, we extend courtesy and um, discomfort to people who we barely know, but we won't do it for the people who uh, we've joined our lives with. So I definitely want to echo that sentiment. Now, you just kind of dropped it in and moved on. You said you worked with Stephen Covey. Like, I, I didn't even know you could work with Stephen Covey. Like that, I, he, he, was, he was one of my primary life mentors. As a matter of fact, one of my de deepest honors was, uh, I, I think he was the final endorsement. A, a zigzag principle was a book I wrote in 2012 that was a lean startup book. It, it, I'm really proud of the success, although I apologize to those of you that read it. I was still a little hopped up on Eagle. Uh, this new version will remove that. But uh, it was one of the last books that if I think the last book that Stephen Covey actually endorsed. And so, yeah, I was very fortunate to have four profound world-class mentors in my life that believed in me and that helped guide me from a young age. And uh, Stephen was one of those four. How do you even get in a relationship with them? Because, I mean... He just <laughs> wrote books and I mean, he yeah. was like the true, the beginning of that thought leadership curve. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't he's amazing. I just, I mourn that we lost him young. Um, how I formed the relationship. I had read a bunch, but at the, uh, his, his books, I was running Mitsubishi electrics PC division here in the U S and I think I single handedly sold more books for him internationally than any person. And so he was aware of that one Number two is uh, my executive admin, uh, this remarkable uh, woman named Sean Jansen. Her mother was Stephen's executive admin. And so that kind of put that together a little bit. And then third is, is as I was, a, uh, I just saw Alexander Hamilton. So I was young, strappy and hungry and I'm not going to throw away my shot, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And I did have some hugely relevant content. Uh, I, at a young age, I developed this thing called uh, the value decision matrix and uh, helping make very complicated decisions. If you're, It's actually for free now on my website. Uh, so I, for years, people have been asking that, of how to make really complicated decisions and reconcile left hemisphere and right hemisphere of brain thinking. And so he became aware of that. And it just these things naturally form, particularly if they're, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I'm definitely the most spitty or was the most spitty, but uh, I always gave, I always gave, I always gave, I looked for ways to give. You quoted Garrett, his value equation, intellectual capital plus relationship capital equals financial capital. And I spent a lot of energy giving and focusing on relationship capital. And I'd say all, all of my life mentors were based on giving. So when the right thing just happens, but it is the, no, I would not have been anything without these four remarkable men in my life. Wow. And then the other thing you said and just kind of moved on is I work with many of the ultra high net worth families around the world. Now, what do you work on with them so that many of them, I think, listen to the podcast, they hear it and then they're just coming in contact with you. They, they might want to find out more. Uh, well, first of all, I, I deeply respect and protect the people I work with. And so they know there's no suck of energy from them, only given love and protection. Most of the families recently have been on this platform of legato family structure, clarifying what the family values are because 90%, 70% thrown away. And that's the tragic stories of the family that just completely gets annihilated by the money, not the wealth, the money. So we build this platform, what they throw away, the symbols, the traditions, the rights of uh, the doctrine and then the rites of passage that then allows them to put in place the financial mechanisms such as fa uh, family banks and family offices and family constitutions and the guiding doctrines. Because most of us just, it's just like spitting, it's garbage spitting in the wind until you have clarity on what the values you're building upon. So that's what a lot of the work has been. That and I've also just 
kind of become, I guess, a, a somewhat known as just helping solve very complex problems. I think having a blind father and an artistic art mother allowed me to learn to look four or five steps ahead and then see behind the corners and paint in words the art of my mother describing to my blind father. And so I, I think that really is the the greatest gift that came out of this scenario I, I grew up in. And, and it has provided me kind of an ability to help people see the complexities and do it in a safe. I would, I would die. I would frost and die before I would ever violate the trust of the people that, that work with me. And so that's an important aspect of, of you know, people that have a lot of uh, resources and a lot of fame that there's not a lot of that in their life. Yeah. Discretion. I can't believe you went there with me on that. I've never responded to that or had that question. Oh, man. Discretion is key. Um, I, I think when you're in a space of vulnerability and you're deciding who you're inviting into your world, you got to pick those that truly understand and aren't trying to figure out what they can get, but looking for ways that they can give. And yeah. that in and of itself is probably an arduous task that many aren't up to. But when you actually make the investment and you find those people, I think you have to hold them close. And so Rich, this is, we've, we've been all over the place. There's so many more questions that I can ask. I'm not going to ask them today because I, I want to be able to bring you back another time and, and dig in more. Uh, this is just a master class on overcoming adversity, having success, not pretending like there is no failure or setbacks on the way to that success, dealing with the shame and the guilt of mistakes and missteps and betrayals and finding forgiveness in that so that you can move forward and use those experiences to help other people heal. Like there, there's nothing more clear in a description of what a dream catcher is than those things, because they are what it takes for us to have resilience and for us to be examples of what is possible if you're not willing to quit or give up. And so I want to thank you for what you shared with me and the audience today, because I think our lives will be forever enriched and even uh, improved when we implement some of the concepts. And it's just a fraction of the concepts that you offered to us today. Well, it's from my heart, it's just really tender of what you're doing and all you dream catchers out there. I just, I just pray you goodness and happiness and wellness, knowing that this entrepreneurial journey is the greatest way that we can create and take control of our lives. And you use the word resilience. And I think that that's what it takes is, is resilience. And even when you get a little bit of plunk in your head, just don't guardrail it so you don't blow everything up, but uh, having resilience to keep going and creating and doing good and I just honor honor you and just uh, just I love the energy. I love how you've shown up, and it's just been a real privilege to to get to know you a little bit, Jerome. Man, well, I hope to continue to deepen the relationship. If you could pick one thing you want the listeners to take away from this episode, what would it be? It's not that serious. Just enjoy life and do all that you can to align the aspects of your life. Don't hide from the messes or the mistakes you've made and it's okay. You know, self-forgiveness and even, you know, it's just not that serious, most of it. And just let go of that, that suppresses us. And if there, I think there's one thing I would say is it's this thing of law, individual balance, life with the family balance and life protecting that. And this, this public manifestation business Gosh, it's just not, I mean, it's good and important, but it's not the main thing. So take the temperature down on that and use wealth, which is we are wealth, time, money, and emotional, physical resource, and get your life in balance. Get that life back in balance with up and down so you can grow your soul, realizing that the most important relationship is, is forgiveness of yourself and self-love. The most important relationship is forgiveness of yourself and self-love. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it from Rich himself. Until the next time, your dreams should be real. We'll catch you on the next episode.